although some of the some of the attributes that we're applying don't really work with inline elements. But we'll see a way around that at, at some point. Um, the div, however, is a block element, and I'm using that. That is a uh, um, that's less used in HTML5, but it's still possible to use divs in HTML5. Um, we looked at a handful of attributes associated with it, and we're going to look at a few more, and then we're going to get into positioning the stuff on the screen. So, where we left off last time was our page, which has a div that consists of an H1 and a couple of paragraphs. <coughs> and we put some things here just so that we could spot the different things on, on the page uh, color-wise. So the body is black. The div has a background of white. H1 has a background of We were playing around with the H1 adding the padding and the width to it. If you recall, remember the, the, the underlying assumption for all this is that part of the appearance it's going to get just from the way that the browser treats those tags by default. And then part of it, we can override that with our CSS. So a div is going to be the, you know, unless we put some style in there, a div is just going to be a tag that goes all the way across the screen. It's a block tag, so the next tags will start underneath it. And it'll have the default background and foreground color. All right. We've added, in this example, uh, a different background color. We put in padding, and we put in a width. If remember... In the box model, the, if we specify the width of an element, we are specifying the amount that's available for content. So in this case, we have 600 pixels. We have that much available for content. Anything we add to it then gets added on to the total real estate that it that takes up on the page. So, for example, in this case, we have a padding of 10 pixels on the top and bottom and 100 pixels on the right and left. So, actually, 10 pixels on the top and bottom is the padding. And there's 100 pixels on the right and left. The implication of this is if we were to look at this, it takes a total of 800 pixels going across. I assume we all know what a pixel is. A pixel is one of the dots on the screen. Your screen's really composed of a bunch of dots close together. All right. And in this case, this H1 has a padding of 100, has 600 for the content, and then another padding of 100. So that adds up to be a total of uh, 800 going across. All right. What's the height of this element? No, that's the width is 620. What's the height of it? Yeah, it doesn't, we haven't specified a height. So it gets the height that the browser feels like making it. All right. That's one thing that, that's important to keep in mind, uh, that you don't need to necessarily always micromanage these style sheets and, and control every single attribute that you can control. Because the browser does just a nice, fine job all on its own uh, in, in many cases. So in this case, you don't really have to specify a height because there's really no real need to. So let the browser figure out how high it needs to be, how tall it needs to be. All right? We're going to add two more things to this. And one of them is a border. All right? And with a border, we can take all kinds of shortcuts. Remember, we talked about padding. We can take shortcuts. We could specify one padding, then it's the padding all the way around. Or if we specify two padding, then it's the top, right, 
bottom left. Um, with the border, we can take similar shortcuts to that, and maybe even, even, even more so. We can specify a border top, a border bottom, a border left, a border right. And then we can specify certain attributes of the border. Border, right, color. Border, right, width. And so on down the line. But oftentimes, what we do is we group all these declarations into one border declaration. And let's, oops, let's review an example of this. So I can say border, one pixel, black, no I don't want it to be black because the, the body has a, is black. We'll make it green and I'll say solid. Actually, to make it more visible, I'll make it 10 pixels. All right, there we have the border. We actually set a whole bunch of attributes with that one declaration. We set the border in all four directions, on the top, on the right, on the bottom, and on the left. And we also set the border color, the border width, the border style. We could do that in multiple declarations. In other words, this is the same as saying border width 10 pixels. Border color green. Border style solid. And that works the same way. Usually, though, I take the shortcut and just lump them all into one big declaration. The browser is smart enough to know that 10 pixels isn't the color, right? Of all the attributes that you can put on a border, the only one uh, that, that could have a value of 10 pixels is the width. So, you don't need to say border width, although you can say border width. The, the thing is, is you can, again, you can, you can take a little bit of a shortcut here and put all the attributes on one declaration. Yeah. So, so I believe so, yeah. Let's, let's see. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure because it, it's a case of, you know, it knows green can't be the width, you know, it knows... Right. Yeah, it, exactly. It, it, it figures out from context uh, what it can be. No, just the space in between. Uh, let's go to W3 schools to get maybe a more um, complete description of CSS borders. So we can set the border style, we can set the border width, we can set the border color, or we can say border top style, border right style, border bottom style. You know, we can, we can break it down, you know, to the specific attribute in the specific side of it. Or we can just do it in a shortcut. A lot of ways to do it. Um, Sometimes people have used an HR tag, which is a horizontal rule, to like be an underline underneath a section of stuff. What I would recommend is, if, is again, don't do that because that doesn't really add anything to the page. Instead, use a bottom border. So, for example, if I wanted this header, let's see, this header here, to have a line underneath it to separate it from the rest of the page, what I would do is I'd simply say in the style, border dash bottom Oops. and then would just get the border going down along the bottom of it. So that's, that's probably a better way to do it because again that underline isn't any content, right? That, 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 that horizontal line. That's not really content on the page. That's just an aspect of how it looks. 
we think it looks better or is more organized or whatever with a with a line underneath it. Therefore, it's something that we do in CSS. I'll put it back to this. You have a number of options for the border style. You can make a dotted border. No, you can't. Not in my class, you can't. <laughs> One of the students says you can make it blank, and it's like, no, no, <laughs> you can't. So you have some choices as far as that. And as far as this goes in CSS3, there's even more stuff that you can do. I'm sure, I'm sure you can investigate some of those things uh, on your own. Um, let's see if we can pull an example real quick. Again, the thing to keep in mind is that um, with some of these newer features, not all browsers are going to support them. Um, but, let's go in and do this. My guess is that this is an old browser and it doesn't support it. Oh well, gee, I wonder where I got that idea from. <laughs> that, in some respects, is is nice uh, about this. Uh, isn't it right there? Pardon me. Isn't it right there? Um, I don't know. Is that really done with styles, or are they are they being tricky and they're doing it with an image? Maybe it's a bottle they put there now. Yeah, let's try that. Yeah, Firefox 3.6 and earlier, duh. And it gives kind of a neat, neater look to it uh, than, than everything being just harsh blocks, squares. So again, there's, there's things that you can do with this. Now, the thing to keep in mind, again, is that the border adds to the total width of that element. So if we add then a 10 pixel border, To that element, this guy now becomes 820, right? Because 10 pixels for the border, 100 pixels, 600 pixels, 100, then 10 again. So if you add all those up, it is a total of 820. They go in this order too. So the, the padding. Another way to define the padding is a pan the padding is the space between the border and where the content actually begins. So in this case, I have a padding of 100 pixels. So from there to there is 100 pixels. 
Now, the one thing that we mentioned before is almost any unit we can express as a percentage instead of as an absolute number of pixels. So I could make this instead of I could do something like this. Should. All right. And notice as I go and make it smaller, Actually, it doesn't look like percentage works for the, the border radius or the border width. I can't really tell if it's resizing or not. That makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, um, a lot of times I cover pixels first because uh, absolute number of pixels are more straightforward. tell if that is doing the radius for sure okay all right that's yeah that's true all right um yeah i talk about the absolute numbers because that's a little more straightforward um especially when we get into layout and floating and things like that it's a little it's a little more predictable and it's a little more obvious what's going on when we use absolute numbers but as you continue on with this, the, the layouts become more and more flexible. Um, that, that's generally a good thing to, to use percentages and M's instead of that. Because just as was stated for uh, different size monitors. And again, especially when you consider things being on a mobile device. All right, a, a website, same website being on a mobile device as opposed to that, you know. Um, you know. It works a lot better if you have, because you know some mobile devices have different size screens and, and, and all that, so it's better if you use percentages as opposed to that. I'm going to go back and set these back to pixels so that we can continue our discussion. Now, next thing we're going to talk about is margins. And margins are a little more complicated. And, and we'll, we'll say why. The, um, the oh, yeah, that would help. All right. I'm going to talk about margins now. Margins are the space between elements. So remember, we're so far the things that we've been talking about, the border and the padding and the width, all deal with a single block. When we talk about margins, we're talking about the space between blocks. Okay? And the way margins work are like this. And you can, again, just like the other attributes, you can have a top, bottom, left, and right. But when you specify a margin, you're specifying the space between two blocks. So if I specify, let's say, 50 pixels here, that will be 50 pixels border to border. Not content, not, not padding, but from border to border. All right. So inside here is everything. Is the border, is the padding, and is the content. Now, here's the tricky part. It's called margin collapsing. All right? And that is, 
if I put a margin of 50 pixels on this guy, and a margin of 50 pixels on this guy, you may think that the total margin, the total space between them is going to be 100 pixels. Nope. The total space between them is 50 pixels. All right. Now, at first glance, that doesn't make sense. All right. But if you really think about it, it does make sense. In other words, what you're saying when you specify a margin of 50 pixels is you want 50 pixels between this guy and whoever's underneath it. All right. Likewise, if I specify a margin of 50 pixels on this guy, I'm saying I want a space of 50 pixels between this guy and whoever's above it. One second, please. Therefore, by adding up the margins, that actually gives us more space than we need, and therefore it will collapse the margin and do 50 pixels. Yes? So it would take the bigger of the two, right. So if you did 50 and 100, it would be 100, right, not 150. Good point. Now there may be some browser issues with this and, and so on, but let's go and try this. Let's go and put a margin, and again, you can specify the margin in, in, in four directions. So let's specify a margin of 100 pixels here and on our paragraph let's specify a margin of 100 pixels. All right, 100, 100, 100, and there's 100 in between. So in other words, if I change this, let's say, to 50 pixels, this is still going to be 100. What do you mean? Right. Um, I'm not following your, your statement. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Well, why, why did it do that? In other words, what you're saying is this header actually goes off of that area, whereas the paragraphs stay within it. Why is that? Because I don't specify a width. Right. Since I didn't specify for a width for the paragraph, if I don't specify a width for the paragraph, how big does it make it? Big as it needs to be. Big as it will fit. The default. The browser's behavior. With the H1, I did specify a width. Therefore, it's going to make it that width. So, it still makes it, keeps it at 600 and all that. And again, when you add the margin on, that margin also gets added on to the total amount of real estate, if you will. That, that something's going to take up. So if I have a margin of 10, then a width of 600, then another margin of 10, that's 620 going across, plus whatever border and padding I would happen to have. But again, I do get that margin collapse. So in other words, um, there's only 50 pixels between the two paragraphs because each of them have a margin of 50 pixels. Well, 50 is enough. It, it did what it needed to. It's able to separate them by 50 pixels. This, this paragraph is 50 pixels away from its neighbor. This paragraph is. So it doesn't need to add them together. So it's logical if you think about it, if you think about really what, what the meaning of a margin is. Yes? Um, well, it pushed that over, I believe. So it gave a margin between the body and the div. 
doesn't seem to inherit to the children, right? So if I make that zero pixels margin for the paragraphs, then it blends all those paragraphs together. So um, the cascading, again, not all attributes cascade or inherit to the children, and margin is one that doesn't. Hey, it gets tricky, believe me. Let me tell you some of my troubleshooting rules for this because this will become especially important as we go forward. And, and uh, you know, I guarantee that, that all of you at some point in the term are, are just going to throw your arms up and have no idea why the page looks the way that it does. All right? And, you know, I do that and I've been making web pages for years. So what do you do? One thing I do typically is I, first thing I do is I remove all the margins. Just see, let's see where these things are laying without any sort of margin in between them. Uh, actually, typically, I will get rid of padding and margins, all right? And then, not to say that that's permanent, not, that's not going to be what I'm going to do in my final version of it, but I'll get rid of that just to sort of, it makes it a little easier to debug, at least in my opinion. Again, these are suggestions, you know, your mileage may vary. I then make things outrageous colors. So I can see where one thing is and another thing begins. So, you know, I, I'm not going to sit there, gee, is that shade of beige there, is that from the body? No, it's going to be like purple and red and yellow. So it really jumps out at me where, where everything is. And those two things are usually uh, good enough. The other thing I will do if I'm having trouble is I will, like, make a copy of my CSS, then delete everything from it, All right, that's what that looks like. Not very good. <laughs> then I'll slowly add stuff in. There we go. To see like where it sort of breaks, where it sort of starts behaving a way that I don't like. You had your hand up a second ago? Oh, I'm kind of to your method. I was going to ask you when you make things. No, I, I didn't make, I really didn't make it disappear. It was black text on a black background. That's why I wasn't able to see it. I mean the code, make the code element. Yeah, is there a way to comment it out? Yeah, there is, but I never remember what it is. Obviously, I can't answer that question, but I don't remember how it is, right? CSS, slash star. Slash star, yeah, yeah. There is a way to comment out CSS. Yeah, uh, yeah I'll give you that. <laughs> exactly, go look it up. Yeah, that, yeah, that probably is an easier way uh, to do it. And, and shame on me for not knowing that off the top of my head. But what can I say? You know, we're all not uniformly strong in every... In, in every uh, skill. Questions about this? Yeah, you can put negative values in. Uh, depends who you ask. The question is, can you use like negative values for margins? Um, you can. Sometimes it comes in real handy. And I guess my take on it is if I have a design and it's just a notch off and if I throw in maybe one negative margin, I'm happy, I'll go ahead and do it. If I have to mess around too much with negative margins, then I probably didn't think things through all the way and all that. I personally don't like it. I mean, that seems, that seems goofy, you know. Maybe it's a sci-fi fan in me and thinking about going in negative space and going backwards through time and you know I just start wondering about all those things and it's like nothing good ever happens when they do that so I don't know if that's the case or what but I, I'm not a big fan of that but again you, you can you can do it you know um, when we study other things uh, uh, other techniques for that especially floating uh, the divs uh, a, a lot of times you can get away from having to do that and that's sort of the approach that I would prefer to take. All right. The next thing we want to do, and I'm going to start with a fresh example 
for this one is we want to we want to uh, be able to position our stuff. All right, so let me start out with a new example. get rid of all this CSS code. And I'm going to do this more in a um, HTML5 sort of way. Notice I won't be using divs, I'll be using the real, the real HTML5 tags. So I'm going to go and I'm going to create a, a little template here for an HTML5 page that would match sort of a hypothetical wireframe that I would have. Let's go back again. What's a wireframe? A wireframe is part of the design document that is a very high level view of what our page is going to look like. For example, we may say we will have a header on the top of the page. A navigation along the side, content over here, and then maybe a footer on the bottom. All right. That might be a real typical kind of layout for a page, right? If you look, there's a lot of, especially smaller sites, a lot of them sort of fit that pattern. So maybe in your design document for your project, you have a wireframe that looks like this. Now, what you want to do again is you want to create a template first. You don't want to write every page from scratch. You want to get a design working the way that you want it to, and then you're going to go in and just clone that a bunch of times. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to put those four main sections in. Actually, for simplicity, I'm going to skip the footer. All right. So I'm going to put three sections in. So I'm going to put a header section. I'm going to put a nav section. And I'm going to put a content section. Alright, those are three of our basic oops, HTML tags that we have. Header, nav, content. And I'm going to put some stuff in them for now. Alright. An H1, let's say. an unordered list of links for my navigation. Now what is navigation? It's a list of links, right? So I'm going to use an unordered list, an unordered list to represent my navigation. good idea generally to make your page index.html, make your home page index.html. I then, I don't, you know, I don't know what this project is, you know, this hypothetical project, 
So I'm just going to go in and I'm going to put page one, page two, page three. But it's a good idea and you should plan ahead to know what these pages are. Because when you create this template and you're happy with the way the template looks, you're going to clone that template, right? And so if you get the page names right, then you're all set to go with your navigation. You don't have to go in and, and rework anything. All right. If you don't get the page names right and you've started cloning it, then you're going to have to go back to each clone to change the page names. And that's something we don't want to do. So the idea here is in our template we're putting common code, code that's going to be on every one of our web pages. Because of that, we want to make sure we get that right. Because once we start copying it then, you know, we're, we'd have to go back and change each copy if we need to make a change to the HTML. We actually don't have that problem with CSS, right? Because the CSS is going to be in a, in a file all by itself. So if we decide to change the CSS, no big deal. All right. So I'll just go and call these page one, page two, page three. But you should have thought through what the pages are on your site. and use the real names for them so that when you define your template it has the real navigation in it. Now, the content that's a portion of the page that's going to vary on each specific page, right? The banner is going to be the same on every page. The navigation is going to be the same on every page. What's going to be different on every page? Well, the content area is going to be different. There's going to be something unique about the content on every page, right? But I want a placeholder uh, in, the, in the template so that I can make sure it lines up the way that I want it to and that it looks the way I want it to. And I probably want some dummy content in there just so that I can make sure that the fonts are readable and so on. So we're back to Greek text. So I'll just go and I'll copy our couple paragraphs worth of Greek text in here. All right. And I'll save it, and I'll view the web page in the browser. Now I'm going to view it in Firefox. I think I'm still using the same old style sheet. Ah. Didn't save the style sheet, All right. There we go. All right. And lo and behold, we're back to the first week of class. <laughs> All right. But you know what? That's a good thing. Because if you remember, one of our aims is to have a very clean separation between the CSS, which is the appearance of the page, and the content, which is the stuff that's in the HTML. If we have that clean separation, then we can do a lot of great things. We can do like they've done on CSS Zen Garden and have different looks, maybe seasonally if we wanted to. If you can imagine a store, maybe they have different appearances depending on the time of the year uh, it, it is. Um, or we could allow people to pick their own CSS file you know, that makes it more readable. For some people, certain color combinations are more readable than others. All right. Or we can style it differently on a mobile device using the media queries that we talked about. Uh, we just mentioned, I think, very briefly. And so the mobile site will look different than a desktop, which makes sense, right? Because a mobile screen's smaller, uh, it's harder to click on links, and so on and so forth. So because our HTML is pure content and looks like this, that's a good thing, all right? So what we're going to do now is we're going to add some appearance to it. And what I'm going to do first of all, just to make it obvious where things are, is I'm going to add a border to everything. All right. Uh, again, you can do it, you can add a color to it, you can add a border to it. 
it doesn't really matter. In this case, I'm going to add a border to it, just so that I see where each section of the page is. So I'm going to go into my position CSS file, and I will say header border five pixels. Um, black solid. And I will do the same thing for nav and content. Go and save that. And Ooh, that doesn't look good. What do you think our problem is here? We can guess what the problem is because we saw a flavor of this problem earlier on today. It's an old browser, right? So it doesn't really know about what a header is, what a nav is, and what a content is. And if we were to view this in Internet Explorer, if we were to view this in Internet Explorer, it also does not look very satisfying. All right? So, what can we do to make it work? Do we throw up our arms and say, well, we're through with HTML5, let's go back to HTML4? Yeah, sometimes maybe you will do something like that, but this ain't going to beat us, all right? We have to tell the browser how to handle HTML5. And we tell Firefox, Mozilla, other browsers, one way. We tell Internet Explorer another way. And typically that's how it is in the web development world. Internet Explorer does things one way, everyone else does it another way. All right? So, this version of Firefox doesn't know about HTML5 tags. All right? But, this version of Firefox if it doesn't know about a tag, it still lets you put a style on it, right? That's why this page looks different than that page in Internet Explorer, right? Firefox is trying to put a border on it. <laughs> it just doesn't know about what a header tag is supposed to be or what a nav tag is supposed to be or what a content tag is supposed to be. So we got to tell it. All right. How do you tell it? Well, we have to tell it that a header actually is a block tag. A nav is actually a block tag. And content is actually a block tag. How do we do that? We do that this way. All right. Now, this is in the book on page something or other. All right? It is in the chapter that talks about CSS layouts. I want to say like two something. I, I don't remember. Pardon me? Layouts chapter. Yeah, layouts chapter 11. So somewhere in there it talks about doing this. Yeah, 286 with older browsers. And they show a line that this is, this is kind of like the line. They have a little bit more stuff in there uh, for Firefox. And when we do that, lo and behold, yay, we got our borders around those things in Firefox. So Firefox takes the approach of if I don't know about a tag, I'm still going to try to style it. And provided you give some little tips to it, 
Namely, hey, this is supposed to be a block tag. You'll work in earlier versions of Firefox. Yes? Does that fix the IE version? That will not fix the IE version. I don't need a crystal ball to tell that one. Mm -hmm. All right? Because... IE takes a different approach. IE takes the approach of, if I don't know about a tag, I ain't doing nothing with it. I don't know what this header tag is supposed to be, so I ain't styling it. That's it. Now, both approaches are reasonable, I suppose. You know, you don't know about a tag, you know, don't do anything with it. That, that, that's okay. And so is Firefox's approach. I don't know about it, but I'll give it a shot. All right? Yep, H1, uh, uh, IE just thinks I have an H1, a UL, and two paragraphs. So what do we, we got to do? I'm going to go to this example that I have, and I'm going to steal some code simply because I don't feel like looking it up on the web. I'm going to go in, I'm going to take this snippet of code and put it on my HTML page. And I'm going to grab a file. And stick it in my, stick it also in my HTML page. This is not a file I created. This is a file from Google Labs or Google Code Thingies. That's the official name of it, Google Code Thingies. And it's called HTML5 Shiv, and it's a JavaScript file. Now, we haven't talked about JavaScript much, if at all, in this class, but essentially what JavaScript is, is it's programming for web pages. It's code that can look and change your web pages and, and mutate them. And there's a lot of reasons why you want to do this. But some very clever fellows out there figured out that if we write some JavaScript, we can make IE finally recognize those section and Etc. cetera, et cetera. Uh, th those tags, the header tag, the, the, the nav tag, and so on. And that's what's in this file. So I'm going to upload this uh, example, again, and you can also find this file on, on the web. And then what I put in my code is this. A little statement that looks like an HTML comment, but since this is IE, it handles this differently. And what this says is, if I'm on IE and I am less than IE9, IE9 is where IE starts behaving itself like other browsers, all right, then run this little bitty script here that will teach IE, will teach the browser how to handle these, how to handle these uh, HTML5 tags. Yes. Yeah, there's, there's a couple ways that you can do that. Um, actually, already this code is in, in a file by itself. You just need to tell it to use, you just need to, need to tell it to use it. Uh, what, what you would do is typically in a case like that, using server-side technology, you'd use an include file. So yeah, you, you can't directly do it in HTML, but you can use an include file. So now, let's go and save this, and let's view our guy in Internet Explorer. 
All right. Ooh, Internet Explorer knows something funny's going on. All right. Knows that there's some JavaScript. So I'm going to allow it. Are you sure you want to allow it? Yes, I'm sure. And there we go. And it doesn't. Is content a legal tag? You know what? <laughs> uh, uh, I'm embarrassed. Let's put article in. Oh, no, no, you know what that is? That's meant to be section, not content. So, yeah, that, yeah, I got section and content confused. Now C section. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Ah. I probably didn't save it. Or not. The section. That's correct. I need to change that. So, for what you call it, and I need to change this for the other one. And now it's a section. All right, there we go. Yay! Well, it didn't work with content, all right? Because content isn't a tag. Content's a tag that I made up in HTML5, <laughs> the MZ version. Yes? Shouldn't this be something you would put on your page? Yep. Because Yep. For the foreseeable future, not everyone is going to have an HTML5 compliant browser. So, yep. Um, should be in every page. All right. And again, even this, and again, you can break this down into two CSS files, right? You're talking about com commonality. This line could be in its own CSS file, and you include that on every single page. All right? And in addition to header, nav, section, it would also do article and a side and footer as well. In fact, let me go and add those in. So you could actually put that in one CSS file and then have your real CSS in another. I'm going to actually go and do that real quick. So now I have two CSS files, my real CSS file, which is position, and my and my funky let's fix Firefox CSS file, which has the little hack in there for older versions. I'm assuming everything has been saved. By the way, sometimes you'll see uh, people talking about like CSS hacks or JavaScript hacks. You know, it's not hacks, you know, in the same sense of like a hacker doing something illegal or, or unethical. Uh, a hack, well, when it's referred to a hack in that context, it means you're, you're getting the, the browser to behave a different way than, than it wants to. It's, it's like, think of it, think of a hack, another way of saying a hack is a workaround. In other words, this is a workaround for earlier versions of, of uh, IE or um, um, Firefox. Now, we're almost ready to start positioning these things, all right? Because we have something that works both in Internet Explorer and Firefox now. Now we can start positioning. Now, one thing to note, and I realize I went over time. I'll send you a bill for the extra five minutes, so don't, don't worry about that, um, is that I'm not doing this in one swoop. I'm not going in and bashing out some epic CSS file 
and then running it and looking to see how it looks in Firefox and then maybe looking to see how it looks in Internet Explorer. All right? Or maybe not. Maybe five minutes before I turn it in, look to see how it looks on Internet Explorer. Right? I'm building this incrementally. I'm doing a little piece at a time. I'm doing the pieces that I'm comfortable with. I did the content. I got that down. Yep, that's the content, all right. I started adding some structure to it by putting borders around it. And then I could add colors to it. And, and notice I'm testing in the different browsers right from the word go, all right. I'm not waiting till I'm done and say, oh, let's open that up in that. And I'm doing it bit by bit, piece by piece. And I'm adding on to it at each step. To, uh, so, so that if I run into a problem, I can take care of it when it's still small. Now, if the next thing I do breaks something, right, I know chances are it's the new thing I've added to that CSS file, all right, as opposed to being the needle in the haystack and being anywhere in a million lines of code. Yes? What browser do you check your homework with? I'm not telling. <laughs> We, you know, uh, you know I, I really can't ask that because it depends where I'm grading it. If I'm grading it at home, I use the browser on my laptop. If I'm grading it here, I use the browser on my desktop. One of the browsers on my desktop. If I grade it in lab, I'm using one of the browsers on the lab. All right? Now, that being said, if I'm in a, a, a unique situation where the only thing I have is like version one links browser, and it doesn't show up correctly, I'm not going to like come down on you real hard. So I'll typically go and look at it in a couple browsers if there is some sort of browser comp compatibility. Because I don't necessarily expect you to test it on every single browser. But I do expect you to do some sort of browser compatibility testing between different browsers. All right? Wrong. Yeah, I would say I, I, I use Google Chrome typically. Yeah, I won't say I won't use, but that's definitely my preference. All right, we'll see you up in lab.